Hello friends, uh, this is Chandrakant from Akul Mac Technologies and uh, I welcome you all to this edition of uh, Jeremy Plain Live. And without wasting further any further moment, let me welcome Jeremy who joins us from UK. Very good morning. Thank you very much. Right, it's our pleasure Jeremy. And uh, we have just finished uh, our Diwali celebrations in India and the neighboring countries and probably in UK and a uh, lot of uh, other countries where Indians are in large population. Um, it's a festival of light. So while we celebrate the festival of light, I think it is uh, very uh, important to also discuss about the next year, uh, how the job scenario would be, because I think it's all shattered in 2020. Uh, people were doing uh, different kind of jobs, trying to find new jobs. So I think uh, your inputs and your uh, valuable uh, insights into this arena would be very valuable for us. That's great. Happy to ha happy to do so. Let's yeah, and and discuss this further. Right. So in the uh, HR arena, the uh, jobs people used to do, for example, there are certain jobs like sales and marketing. And because of the pandemic, people did not have the opportunity to travel, meet the client, and the digital world has taken over that part. But then there are other industries which are very badly, severely uh, affected, which are hospitality, for example, uh, travel, tourism, and uh, there are a few more, uh, which requires logistics operations. So, uh, in, you know, NetNet, there has been a major joblessness uh, across the world in all countries, while there are emergence of new types of jobs. So I would like to know from you is, what are the opportunities going forward uh, now and going forward for next decade? If you can throw, uh, based on your research, if you could throw some light on that. Yes, yeah. So so I did, I, you just referred to it. So I did a piece of research around the shifts and transformations of human capital. And I've been working on so-called HR 4.0 for some time now, which is the digitalization of HR and how we manage our organizations and uh, workforces. But of course, coming into 2020, many organizations were faced with all of these transformations anyway. And the pandemic has served to accelerate those. And that's it being experienced in in no greater area than the heart the human heart of our businesses so the the three major shifts maybe before before going into actually where the future is the three major shifts that are being accelerated of course is the digitalization of hr so how how do we manage more remote workforces how do we enable them how do we support them collaborate communicate all of those kind of things but two other major major shifts are happening. The first is within the workforce. And in the research that I did, which is called blended workforce revolution, and the blended workforce is defined as the mix of permanent employees, independent workers, digital workers, traditional workers, remote and centrally based workers, all of this mix coming together. Uh, we predicted at that point that by 2025, that 50% of the global workforce would be made up of independent workers. What's very interesting since then, we have gone back to the research and in um, the probably the end of July, early August, we realized coming back with, the, with new data that this is accelerated to the end of 2022. So it's a big, big, big challenge at human capital level. And the third one, of course, is being impacted by that and the pandemic at the moment, which is the shift in terms of workplace and ways of working. So will we, as I think we said last week, go back to what we used to do? Or will we start to look ahead at possibilities around actually we may not need the bricks and mortar places, uh, the big offices? Uh, companies like PwC, uh, McKinsey are already saying, and some of the big banks actually are already saying, that we're going to take out 30 to 40% of our major offices because we found new ways of working. So all of these sort of shifts are, are revolving around and accelerating, almost slingshotting out of the other side possibility. So yes, 
we have had a lot of challenge. Uh, we have had joblessness. We have had uh, worries, not just at work, but at home. And out of that worry and out of tough times comes the need to act very quickly and to do things uh, more creatively and to find new ways forward. And this is what we're starting to see emerging now almost like a butterfly out of a cocoon, lots of different possibilities. And some of these trends I've been talking about are accelerating. So from, from a job perspective, organizations that may have been really struggling have found new ways to work and that is protecting the employee base within them. They just may find a different mix of employees. Also though, though some of those people that have lost their jobs or that have been had been in the past thinking, well, you know what, I think I should do something on my own, but I really don't have the courage to do it. They've been accelerated to do that right now. So we're seeing a growth in that too, which I'll, which I'll come to a little bit later as well. So we're seeing lots of these things starting to rise and that will, that will steady over 2021 and we will see that a little bit further. But that will be, for me, the foundation, what I've talked about there, the foundation for the decade ahead, CK. So uh, as for your research, uh, the new jobs in the digital arena, or rather the jobs which existed in 2019, uh, about 20% of them have moved to digital arena. So what it takes to get these jobs, how to fill these positions, do you have any insight on that? Well, it's a very good question, actually. Um, and in, if we look at, we're in the fourth industrial revolution right now, so-called digital age, that you know, biological, physical, digital, all coming together, uh, as we've talked about before. We've seen this transformation before, and some of the things we hear through these transformations and these big changes into the next industrial revolution is that lots of jobs will be uh, lost, uh, people will uh, not be, in, uh, the, the rise of automation will take all of our jobs, robots and AIs coming in, what are we going to do? What we forget is exactly what you just said there, is that job creation is a major output from the shift to a new industrial revolution. But when we go through change, often we're too quick to see the negative and what could happen rather than look at the possibilities. And that's what we're looking at now. The big challenge that, though that I think coming is at human capital level. So we have potentially these new jobs, but what we also have is a talent gap. We also have a will gap. So it's the skill and the will. Uh, some people actually may not be interested in those kind of jobs, but at the same time, those people that are, there is a skills gap that needs to be needs to be filled. So how do organizations do that? Well, the way that many are looking at the moment, which explains the rise of the independent workforce, is going to more contingent workers. And they're saying, you know what, actually, we do have these new jobs, let's say, we do have these new needs within the organization. We have needs in even our existing jobs. For example, you mentioned it straight right at the beginning. We need to change how we sell. We can't just, you know, we may not be able to go and see our customers for six months. So we need to master the virtual sell. That is a completely new skill set for many, even traditional salespeople. They still have their, they can still use the skills that they know, like uh, great questions, handling objections and presenting, but actually managing it in this format takes some nuance. And they need to kind of, if you like, create an edge around the skills that they know and create new skills. So it's not just about the new jobs. It's also about the new knowledge, skills and behaviors that we need to display for the workforce of tomorrow today. So that's why many organizations are saying, well, we don't have to be too worried about how we fill in inverted commas some of these things because we can actually think differently. And I think this is where organizational design, OD, and HR and human capital management come together and say, we have an opportunity here to relook at how our organizations are structured, how they're managed and how we manage them. It is not true now to say that we need a 100% permanent workforce um, uh, within, within our four walls that we work in or moving forward. We can embrace the rise of the independent workforce. We can embrace a new blended workforce. And therefore, when we're looking to fill some of these skills gaps or some of these um, potentially 
short term roles that we need to get geared up. We can look more at creating great relationships with independent workers. But for me at the moment, that is through things like managed services. It's based on projects. What my argument is, is that now that now needs to be formalized and we need to think about how we embrace independent workers who can really contribute to our business so that we value them, recognize them, reward them in the right way and make them feel like they're part of the team as much as being independent workers. So quite a lot really coming in here, but equally to answer your question, there's so many more solutions now, I feel. Uh, Jeremy, I think you uh, make a very interesting proposition about building relationships with independent workers. Um, but you know, there is a skill gap. In fact, uh, you know, in past few lines, you also mentioned there is a huge skill gap that exists today because even the experienced workers may find it challenging to shift to digital platform seamlessly because they may have uh, negotiation skills, but they need eye contact, they need facial reading, uh, and the digital platform does not allow that uh, seamlessly. Uh, so there is a huge skill gap that exists. I think the understanding of this skill gap is also fairly uh, widely accepted. The problem is how do we fill the skill gap? Uh, for example, uh, IBM Watson has tied up with uh, a government department in India and India being a very populous country with young population. Uh, there is a department for skill development. It, it offers a free skill development to people who do not have a lot of funds. And, you know, 30% of the population uh, in India fit that, uh, you, you know, uh, description. So IBM Watson has tied up uh, with Skill Development Corporation to provide digital skills to whoever wants to get uh, trained on the digital skills. Uh, and this is absolutely free, absolutely free. So having said that, there are other uh, initiatives across the world as well, like Microsoft announced uh, spend of $23 million in uh, learning and development, specifically around digital arena. Uh, while all these developments are happening, I think I'm sure a lot of other corporations are investing in this space. There is still going to be skill gap because by the time this workforce is ready uh, over next one year, two years, Till then, what are your advices to people to, you know, make use of the opportunity which exists today? Actually, there's quite a lot within that, what you're talking about here. There's quite a lot going on which, which impact the whole. And the way that if we, if we go back to 2008 and we hit the global financial crisis, that was a 10 year crisis. And then there was uncertainty. We came into this new decade with a little bit more hope. We were taking a deep breath. We could get back onto track again. But then the pandemic hits, of course. But within that period, many organizations, when they're looking at um, transformation, when they're looking at upskilling and so on, it takes budget. The more enlightened organizations, as you're talking about, are more attuned to putting budget to, aside to that. But there were many organizations that didn't. Budget moves away from things like learning and development, uh, some nice to have HR initiatives, even some nice to have uh, marketing initiatives at time. So what happens is that the, the skills development that happens either is very standardized, which may not be appropriate, but it doesn't really evolve very much. So as people are coming back into spending, you know, after the global financial crisis, for some organizations, they're 10 years out of date. But the pace of change within this, within this digital era is so quick. And as you pointed out before, we've got all of these gaps within our organizations, not just in terms of roles, but also how we do things differently for the new era. And that came home to roost for many organizations when March hit this year and we realized that this was not going to go away. So we needed, so marketing needed to very quickly digitalize. What does it mean now getting our message out there differently? Sales, as I talked about, finance, HR, every, you name it, the whole, the whole thing needed to upskill themselves before, before they could upskill the organization. Then add that to the previous point that you said, is that, but we need people in these really key roles. How are we going to get them? And some organizations realize that actually, because the, the supply is so low, but the demand is so high, they're going to cost a lot of money. And we can't afford to do that. So how do we do things differently? 
we need to find somebody who's skilled in it but we need to probably look at different ways of bringing it into the business and that then explains partly how the independent workforce is growing so quickly but the very interesting point about that ck is that in the last two years the population so this is according to the research the blended workforce revolution which uh, i launched earlier this year uh, which you'll be able to find on my website i think you're going to put the link on for people to download it for free the paper if you're interested is that we found that the generation making the biggest shift to independent working was generation x that's my generation and your generation yes yeah? so we're, we're both we're both x's um and we we're both, we both made it to the top of the organizations that we worked with before. I was one of the senior leadership team within the, within the global business that I was in before. But like many Gen Xers, I looked into my organization and said, you know what? I don't want to take over this business. We have not transformed quick enough. I've got a big problem if I take over this business. I'm, I'm not up for it. I can do this better from the outside. So what's, what's, what's even more fascinating than that is that I'm now able to have um, retained jobs, two or three retained jobs with different companies doing more or less the same role, helping them at a very senior level in a very niche way, potentially, you know, whether it be around skills, around digital, around the new roles that are there, helping them refine their organizational structure. Um, but in, in a moment of time that A, they can afford and B, that we can get the, the best value out of. So Gen X's are making that move. So it actually compounds the issue that you're talking about in some ways, as well as providing a solution. On one level, I can actually do things differently now as an organization. I don't have to have a permanent person. I can pick uh, an independent person. However, if I'm losing my leaders in waiting, in the organization, I've got a big skills gap there. This is where a lot of the, the 20th century businesses who haven't got into 21st century thinking yet, as we talked about last week, are really struggling because they're thinking, they're thinking in the way that they used to think about, not in the way that they need to think about now and thinking about changing the complete structure of the organization, unleashing capabilities around the organization, but also embracing as part of their workforce people that can come in for the short term, for independent work, for project work at a very senior level, as much as a uh, very kind of, if you like, um, project um, digital IT work that they're traditionally used for. So quite a lot to think about. Right. So it is a lot easier for the IT uh, companies to transition uh, to digital arena quite easily. But there are other uh, works of life which will find a very challenging to shift in the new world. Uh, things like production, things like operations. What is your advice to these kind of people? Yeah, yeah. Well, with all of this that, I, that I've said here and the increasing digitalization, and that could be in manufacturing, in supply chain, in logistics, all of these kind of things as well, is that we're still reliant on the human touch, whether that's internally with our employees and whether that's with our customers as well. So one of the issues that seems to be arising for the organizations that are still struggling this year is that they've lost sight of the human touch as they have desperately trying to digitalize, find new processes and ways of working, systems to support the way that they're working in the areas that you're talking about. But the danger is, is that they've missed the human heart of this as well. So I've just done a new piece of research. It's not released yet, so I can't go into the detail. However, the 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 big the biggest emerging leadership trait for the decade ahead is human centered leadership closely followed by community centered leadership and both of these are two sides of the same coin it's actually looking internally and externally and mobilizing our resources so that they can be part of the solution rather than um, isolating these problems that you talk about in, in some of these really kind of more technical areas to just the leadership of the organization. This is about empowering not just our permanent employees, but it's the independent workers. It's also empowering uh, leadership at all levels, something that we have been talking about for many, many years so that our employees can be part of the solution uh, rather than the, the implementers of uh, the, the, the next new idea that has come up from the management or the leadership that says, this is where we're going to go. So I think that is a really key component in those kind of areas there. At the same time, 
as not just implementing digitalization, but actually thinking about how they automate many of these processes and systems. So actually automation, this is the year of automation. Many automation companies have been the, the answer to many prayers in the areas that you talk about for many organizations globally. And automate, automation, as I say, has come of age, and that will be 2021 where many other organizations are playing catch up is where they'll focus, that and the human touch. In fact, uh, you, whatever you say is, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense, uh, but uh, there are uh, businesses which are still uh, not started the race. I mean, the catch up will be quite tough for them. Uh, yep. Businesses like schools, media houses, advertising, uh, which can uh, migrate uh, quite easily on the digital platform, but they have not done that. And then there are uh, people who will find it very difficult to migrate like production and operations. Um, and uh, uh, Jeremy, you are a truly global citizen and you work with large corporations uh, now helping them in their journey migrate uh, on the digital arena. Do you have a model which can be utilized by SMEs or startups or even large enterprises which they can access to well yeah yes there are a couple actually um that i have which which i feel have been models to create out of the transformational period that we're in not something to reinvent that's already there but actually something that causes a rethink around this because you, you you're absolutely right I, I do work globally I work with many industries and another industry I'll throw in there which is really suffering at the moment is the entertainment industry so we talked about you know mice um, tourism uh, leisure hospitality but entertainment as well so think about uh, the how we experience going to the movies um, the industry growing around this. It's not just the movie theatres, it's what comes into them as the product as well, movie making, TV making, and the rapid, the rapid evolution now of how movies may be released in the future uh, to drive the kind of revenue. So, so those, those are big studios that didn't have relationships with the major new streaming partners like Hulu, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, all of these kind of things are struggling to think about the kind of partnerships that can get their product to market now. They're having to rethink their whole thing because this never came into their mind. So while movies like Tenet were really the test case for um, could this work in a new way of experience movies movies at the, at the cinema, it made around $400 million, which was probably about $1 billion less than it should have done uh, normally but they're calling that a success now. Whereas something like the film um, uh, released on Amazon Prime a couple of weeks ago, Borat 2, has caused, uh, from Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, caused an absolute sensation and is now being measured in a very different way in terms of audience uptake, viewerships and so on for Amazon Prime and what that actually means from a money perspective. So it's at, one, at macro level, industries are having to rethink how they how their relationship with their customers with how they look at um, usership revenue how they're going to measure margin underpinning all of that though there needs to be a new approach with how we manage this changing face that i've talked about the digitalization the workforce the workplace so there is a model that I created at, um, at digital level, which is the ticking clock, which I think I may have mentioned in one of our previous discussions, which is around how to help organizations who are still struggling to rapidly digitalize so that they don't lose the human touch, but they actually can enable the most appropriate technologies. But for much of what we've been talking about today, still organizations are traditionally structured with a human capital management approach, which is from yesterday and is not appropriate for tomorrow. So I've come up with something called Gig HR, which is really a framework for today. It's not a framework, actually, it's a manifesto. It's a new manifesto for human capital management, which looks at this differently. It looks at the need of organizations with their permanent workforce, but the trend that 50% of our workforce will be made up of independent workers within, within two years. 
our current human capital management structure does not allow us to manage that in a way. So my approach for gig HR is to think about, so how do we underpin this new structure with uh, thinking about the cultural aspects that need to be in place when you're managing a permanent and an independent workforce? And then what are the rules, the tools that need to be in place, the new skills, and how do we actually engage and create those thrills for our workforce, uh, whether permanent or employees? And then if I kind of wrap that all around something else, it's then how do we protect them in an era of rapid change, digitalization, um, partic particularly learning from this year with well-being at the, at the center. So Gig HR recognizes that many organizations will have a very mixed workforce or a blended workforce as I like to call it and this is a framework to enable that to be managed uh, but also challenges organizations who particularly have a 20th century model right now to transform more rapidly so that they're ready for this type of workforce tomorrow. Yes, uh, uh, Jeremy, in fact, uh, this rapid changes in our uh, business arena and uh, you know, how we do basically business with each other, uh, that has forced various governments across the world to also reformulate the, uh, the policies around the digital world, how to use, and you mentioned media. So there is a new policy which is going to come up to manage the OTT platform, what they can show, you know, what they cannot show and so on. So I think while you are uh, very graciously sharing your big HR uh, framework, which people can download and use it if they can. But uh, I think there is a lot of handholding required to understand the whole dynamic around it. So ladies and gentlemen, I am going to urge the viewers of this program that if they need to get in touch with Jeremy to take, take his advice, to really help you build your organization uh, in a new format, so that they are geared up to do business in 21 and beyond, please reach out to his uh, website, which is mentioned in the messaging box down below, or you can reach out to us and we can connect with you, uh, 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 Jeremy and you, and you can then take it forward from there. So I think your inputs and your work, which you're doing globally, Jeremy, is very valuable, specifically in the area of HR. And I think this is going to help us help my company and also the viewers of this program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, CK. And we will catch up with you, Jeremy, next week with a uh, more compelling business proposition, business uh, topic next week. We will. Thank you. Bye-bye.